Good morning. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 11. And as you do, what an Easter we had. Thank you, friends, for uh, uh, making it all that it could be through Lent and, and Holy Week. I, spe- I, just, I honestly couldn't be more prouder of this church this past uh, Holy Week and how we worshiped and gave witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, it was a challenging and yet very fruitful Lenten season. And I want to personally thank every volunteer, every uh, greeter, every musician, every choir member, every staff member, uh, everyone who helped uh, serve all of the guests that came and were a part of our worshiping community uh, these last six weeks, but especially through Holy Week. Thank you. Thank you. But Easter is just the beginning. Do you view repentance in the same way now? We've learned a lot about the many layers of repentance and what repentance means for us, but it would be a mistake to think that Jesus died and rose again just so we could be forgiven. Now, that's important, and that's a crucial aspect of the cross, but there's so much more. It is that by repentance, that churning from the life and kingdom of our own and churning towards God and the kingdom that God is building, that we see and enter into a whole new world of faith. Hopefully that's what you got last week in the Easter sermon is there's a whole new world for us. And the writer of Hebrews sets up our new teaching series perfectly, starting with verse 1. Listen to this. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Okay, I'm going to pause right there. I'm just going to take little, little parts of this at a time. As the writer of Hebrews says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. You remember the words of Jesus when he said to Thomas last week, we said this, you are blessed because you have seen me risen and alive. Remember his hands, his side, he said, touch But how much more are those who have not seen? This is faith, dear friends. It's uh, what we see from the life of the ancients. Now, ancients is a term we don't often use, but the writer of Hebrews is referring to the ancients as those who preceded Paul and the disciples and Jesus, those who are in the Old Testament scriptures, people like Ruth and Abraham, Moses and David and so on and so forth. I wonder, when was the last time you studied the ancients? When was the last time we considered how the ancients could speak to our faith and our day too? Because we too have to put faith into Jesus Christ, one who we can't touch and see physically, but whom God is leading us to grow in faith. And uh, I'm inviting you to join me over the next, if you can believe this, this is a uh, I'm so excited for this, and I've been preparing, preparing for quite some time. Over the next five months, we're going to be studying the life and journey of Moses as it relates uh, to the nation of Israel and our own faith. And uh, today, I want to do a couple of things to set that up. First, I want, to, I want to just give an introduction to why the study of ancients is important. And then we're going to get into the life of Moses just briefly and uh, set up some things for the coming weeks. And then lastly, I want, to, I want to encourage you in your own faith, okay? So those of you who are watching the clock, there's three goals there, and uh, you can check them off as I get there. But before we get there, let's, let's let the writer of Hebrews tell us why this is so important. Why is it? Of all the things the writer of Hebrews could have said that we needed to understand, uh, this is so important. Verse uh, 13 says, all these people, that is the ancients that lived prior to Jesus, were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had an opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a far better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Let me pause there. This is graduate level faith. No doubt about it. 
one that we too are invited into. Faith that doesn't just look at our current circumstances or demand proof of God's existence and his promised land in whatever form each of us would choose or desire. No, instead, we see the promises of faith from a distance, just like the ancients. In a moment, we'll see who these figures are, but I want to pause here and speak to a phenomenon in our culture, especially, unfortunately, within Christian communities, that is just so destructive. And may very well be true for many of us, although I I doubt it in this circle of our church. But I was reflecting and reading on how consumerism shapes us in our day. How consumerism shapes Americans in our day. This is a phenomenon that is altogether new in human history. Okay, Consumerism wasn't a facet to be understood in the days of the biblical writers. Not anywhere near uh, to the degree that we experience it. And I was reflecting on this and how it distorts our faith. And I came across this writing of Dan White Jr. where he speaks to how consumerism has robbed us of the wisdom of our elders. Okay. Now he says things, some things here that I'm not going to necessarily focus on. But he says this. How sh- consumerism shapes us. First, if I like something, I must have more of it. So there's absence of moderation. Okay. It's the first one. The second one is I expect excellence in whatever I participate in. Okay. Usually this happens even within church communities where the first question we tend to ask, myself included when I'm visiting other churches, the first question is, well, what did you think of church? Very rarely do we ask the question, what do you think God thought of my worship presence today? I wonder how God felt about my full-bodied worship and praise of him, right? No, we think the other way. What did you think of the sermon? Or how did you like that you know, music piece? Whatever it may be. But I expect excellence in whatever I participate in. But this is the one, that, uh, one of two that really caught me. Three, my unique needs must be met. Irregardless of others' needs, if my unique needs aren't met, then uh, I'm disappointed. Number four, when something is no longer stimulating, I move on. That's so true, of course. Uh, uh, five is boredom is intolerable. But number six is another one that caught me. I need new and updated, not old and dated. I need new and updated, not old and dated. Is there any surprise? And I bold number three and number six for a reason. Is there any surprise that our secular culture discards the wisdom of elders and worships at the altar of youth? Each of these uh, points that Dan White Jr. makes is confronted by an alternative narrative in the gospel. We're not going to spend time on that today. But this third and sixth point uh, have seeped so much into our faith communities that many people don't even consider the Old Testament elders, the ancients, as essential to our own faith. I've been in circles of Christians who said, I don't even read the Old Testament anymore. Save a psalm or two when I need it. But to look at the the Old Testament characters as uh, embodiments of faith that we could learn from, in fact, they are essential to how we learn, not so much for many people. Furthermore, we will pour time and devotion into the newest book about faith or theological fad rather than scripture, Scripture itself. And it's because often of this consumerist mindset that's seeped into us that we think newer is better. Younger is better. And the writer of Hebrews would emphatically disagree. It's the wisdom of the ancients, the faith of the ancients that we must reclaim. And with a posture of humility to learn from so that we too can exhibit an active faith. Because without these ancients, we wouldn't be here. Can I get some amens from some people who are a little farther on in age? Come on. I mean... This is just so true. Now, comically, my children think I'm ancient, so I, I resonate with this. In fact, I, I laugh uh, all the time. People think, uh, often in this church, I'll say, oh, Aaron, he's so young. But then the young people in the church say, Aaron, he's so old. There's no winning. But I was, I was humbled by this, just this reality when we began to work through our family photo albums. Uh, for my dad's memorial, my father's memorial. Some of you know, a couple months back, he passed away. And, uh, and it's just, it's really a fascinating thing. 
I'm always putting things before the Lord, just saying, Lord, like, help me understand why you brought that memory to mind or, or this uh, feeling and emotion. But uh, as we were working through some of the uh, family photos, there were things I learned about my father just by looking at snapshots of his life. And I wasn't mature enough to maybe see them uh, earlier. But this is a picture of him uh, months before his mother was killed by a, a uh, drunk driver. This is his last photo uh, uh, with her and uh, one of the last photos with her. And what I noticed is that um, there were no other photos with that smile after that point. And uh, there was something that I learned about my dad about how he had to, he had to learn a lot of hard lessons at a very young age, uh, four or five years old. And uh, he had to he had to figure out faith and he had to, to heal some wounds and some very deep, deep wounds in order to be a functional and loving father that he was to me. Second one I saw was his dad. I've said before, his dad never told him he loved him, but this was just a, a tender little picture of his dad playing with him in the yard. They were, they were not uh, of means, uh, but, uh, but this moment with his dad and any, anyways, as I share these photos, I don't want to get caught up on this, but, um, it just made me appreciate him and his faith journey all the more because it made such an impact on my life. We're going to go back and we're going to take a look at some old family pictures of the church and of God's people in the life of Moses. And we're going to see them again for the first time, perhaps, even though we've, we've known these stories or we've, we've got some understanding of, of the stories of Moses. We're going to relive them. And we're going to learn new things about ourselves. Because the ancients, they are our fathers, and they are our mothers. And the writer of Hebrews is intent on a lineage of faith that is exemplary. And after a brief description of Abraham, it's Moses that he dwells on. Of all the Old Testament characters, he dwells on Moses. And if there was any introduction I could give into the life of Moses today, it would, it would be incomplete compared to just this quick synopsis of the kind of faith that Moses exhibited. And it's uh, going to start right here with verse 23. Will you read with me? Let's look at this picture. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith. Those two words are the most important description of this man, Moses. By faith, Moses was used by God to establish a people, a nation, that would bring hope to the world. And by faith, he believed Jesus would come as Messiah, even though it would be centuries later. And through his story, we'll learn how our faith can thrive today. It's been some time since we've done a character study. If you know how we have patterns at EPPC, we have biblical studies, theological ones, sometimes even just pastoral uh, emphasis for how we live the faith in our life. This is going to be a character study like we've never done before. And God has called us to join in the story of Moses and to learn from the story of faithfulness in the midst of adversity. God has called us too to be change makers. You're going to hear that phrase. Change makers by our faith. How does Moses lead us is the question. How does Moses' leadership of a community speak to us today? And I think you'll find that Moses is a remarkable human being. No human in the story of scripture led as challenging a life as that of Moses. And yet he is understood to be the most consequential figure in all of Scripture, save Jesus Christ himself. 
And interestingly enough, this is a little tidbit too. He's actually present in the New Testament. Anybody remember where Moses shows up? Transfiguration. You're absolutely right. So he's, he's the time warp guy, right? No spoilers for the Avengers Endgame, but, uh, but that storyline was written long ago. That he jumps into the New Testament story even and is present there. I love it. But it wasn't because Moses was a perfect man or that he was a winsome communicator. We know he wasn't. Or that he came from the right family blood. It was because of his faith. It was because of his faith. The Apostle Paul says that we are justified. We are put right with God by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith. Faith is the key to living the power of the resurrected life of Jesus in our lives. Faith is the key. So we've got to keep the faith. We've got to keep the faith. This is going to be the theme for our coming series. As a child, I didn't fully grasp the significance of it, but looking back on the struggles that my father was living through, it's clear to me that there was something in that phrase, keep the faith, that could help him keep going. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is getting at. The chapter begins, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then it goes on after sort of defining faith. It goes on to give examples of all these people who lived by faith, including Moses. And if you take some time this week and you read that list, these folks all shared something in common. Every one of them swam against the current of their time. Every one of them marched to the beat of a different drummer, the drummer... uh, Yahweh, every one of them lived against the odds, and each one of them made a difference for the kingdom of God. But Moses is the one that stands out. And his life and his legacy will teach you to keep the faith, and that faith will keep you because the source of that faith is the living God. Amen. Now, the writer of Hebrews goes on, and I'm going to just close with a few verses so you get a sense of the whole picture here. The writer of Hebrews goes on, and you can almost feel the writer getting excited. All of that by the power of faith, so keep the faith now would be a good time for an altar call. We've already clapped. Let's all get on the altar here and just say, Lord, give. We ask, would you give us faith? Would you teach us faith? And that faith will keep you because the source of that faith is the living God. It sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But you read on in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, faith is not all hunky-dory. The writer says, others were tortured. These are the people who believed and had yet to see. Others were tortured. This is going to get a little bit gruesome, so uh, be ready. Refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection... Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. And yet, by the power of this faith, they endured persecution. They kept on in spite of the odds, against the odds, swimming upstream, And then in a burst of glory in the 12th chapter, the writer says this. And let me just close with this passage. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. And let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. How do we do that? The writer says, by looking to Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of our what? Faith who for the sake of the joy that was before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and is taken up at the right hand of the throne of God. And even today, he is blessing and giving faith to those who ask, to those who want to learn. Keep the faith, and that faith will keep you. But it's not easy. The late Harry Emerson Fosdick, arguably one of the greatest preachers of our time, once said, the world has two ways of getting rid of Jesus. The first is by crucifying him. The second is by worshiping him without actually following him. The world has two ways 
of getting rid of Jesus. First is crucify him. The second is by worshiping him, but not actually following him. In one sense, it's pretty easy to worship Jesus on Sunday, but it's something else to follow Jesus out there in the world on Monday, isn't it? With our money, with our words, with our tenderness, with our faith. It's easy to be a member of a church in that sense, but something altogether different when we decide to take on the call to discipleship. Discipleship in community is much more difficult and demanding. Discipleship is about following Jesus by living by his teaching, by what he actually taught, and by living in the spirit of this very life. And it's not easy. It's way easier just to live by a political party or a spiritual tradition. But to follow in the ways of Jesus, that takes faith. God bless you, friends. Let's keep the faith in this series. Let's grow in our faith. Will you join me? Let's pray. Lord, by looking at the life of Moses, we pray that we will learn to keep the faith as the writer of Hebrews has shown is so meaningful and powerful and important. Would you help us to keep the faith? To keep the faith when we think we know what we're doing and to keep the faith when we don't. To keep the faith on the mountaintop of success, which many of us have known, and to keep the faith in the valley of humiliation and grief. Help us to keep the faith in you because you have faith in us. You have given us life. You have given us this great pearl of the gospel. And by that faith, will you keep us as we keep you? Help us to learn from the life of Moses and the ancients. Help us to resist the tide of our culture and instead to be swept away by the power of your spirit so that we may keep the faith. We pray this in your name, Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, and all God's people said, amen, amen.